So what does the performance of far-right parties mean for the EU's migration policy? Hussein Baumi, an EU advocacy officer for Amnesty International, focusing on the Middle East and North Africa, shared what he expects from the new EU parliament. Uh, good afternoon. Um, so, I mean, I think it's uh, important not to overstate the success of the far-right uh, in this uh, election, uh, while we did see um, uh, results uh, for the far right uh, very successfully in Germany and France, for example, uh, is the case was not the same uh, in Scandinavia. However, um, I think uh, people, particularly from my uh, migrant backgrounds, have all the reason to be uh, concerned uh, because over the last few years, what we have seen is that traditional and mainstream parties have been taking very um, problematic. Uh, migration policies, both in terms of um, the rights of migrants and refugees inside Europe, but also in terms of migrants and refugees trying to reach uh, Europe through externalization um, deals. Let's not forget that, of course, um, EPP party led by uh, the current Commission President von der Leyen has been the one signing all the deals with countries like Tunisia, uh, Egypt um, and Mauritania. So what are the kinds of changes you are expecting in EU policy on migration? So we expect, uh, moving forward, we expect to see more externalization deals that aim to uh, to keep um, migrants and refugees outside of European borders at any cost. We expect to see um, attempts uh, to adopt policies that would facilitate uh, the violation of rights of migrants and refugees inside Europe, uh, for example, through uh, detention, through uh, deportations, uh, through uh, denial of the right to uh, housing, to health, um, as well as the denial of right to seek um, asylum, as is according uh, to them by international law. In May, uh, the EU uh, agreed on a new uh, uh, migration pact, if I'm not wrong. Could you tell us what the salient features of that pact were, and do you see these elections having an impact on that pact? Indeed. So the pact uh, at its core, it aims at uh, two things. First, to make it more difficult for migrants and refugees to reach uh, Europe. And second, to make it easier uh, to deport um, refugees and migrants um, outside uh, Europe. However, the pact does have uh, several pillars and uh, one of them is human rights. So the question now remains um, that within the next, um, uh, before the implementation um, of the pact takes place, uh, to see the action plans that will be adopted by the different member states, as well as the roles that will be played by the Commission, uh, not just in enforcing the pact, uh, but actually in um, upholding human rights um, regulations. So uh, as Amnesty International, we will continue uh, to reach out and call uh, on all um, actors um, to ensure that human rights are put at the forefront of their um, work and to ensure that uh, human rights for all, including migrants, refugees, uh, are at the heart of uh, policymaking at the EU. Surveys also show that migration was one of the top concerns for many EU voters alongside the economy and international conflicts. Do you not think that those issues are actually closely interlinked? Indeed, um, and for on lots of uh, levels. Um, on the one hand, you see um, a, a number of political parties, uh, particularly those on the right and the far right, uh, they do not seem uh, to want to address the real issues uh, connected to um, uh, housing, uh, connected to health, connected to uh, cost of living, that most uh, European voters uh, feel very close um, to them. Instead, they prefer to lay, say, the blame uh, on migrants, on refugees, um, and therefore to make uh, the main issue or the main discourse is about migration, where they feel much more comfortable um, in discussing. Uh, as, uh, in addition to this, also when it comes to conflicts, uh, you see that uh, instead of talking about uh, the role that, play, uh, that Europe plays in, for example, exporting arms, in supporting uh, authoritarian regimes, um, in supporting different forms of violence outside Europe, which eventually leads to uh, people seeking refugee uh, and coming to Europe to seek um, safety uh, as a right uh, from these uh, conflicts and violence. Uh, so instead of talking about this, they want to talk about uh, migration as uh, a separate uh, problem. On the other hand, you also see that uh, traditional parties, including those on the left, uh, instead of trying to formulate uh, or to reshift the discussion to these very issues about health, housing, 
uh, education, uh, cost of living, um, conflicts outside. Instead, they end up adopting uh, language and policies uh, that are being pushed for originally by the far right and now that they have become quite mainstream in European uh, discourse. We'll uh, leave it there for the time being, but thanks so much for joining us today. Hussein Baumi, EU Advocacy Officer from Amnesty International. Thank you so much. So big gains for Europe's far-right parties, but the centre-right is still the biggest bloc in the European Parliament. So here's a look at what to expect next. The day after the European elections and current EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen has already started working on securing her second term. My goal is this. My goal is to continue on this path with those who are pro-European, pro-Ukraine and pro-rule of law. Together we will and can form a bastion against the extremes of left and right. Von der Leyen and her centre-right European People's Party were the winners of the election night. And the main losers, the Greens and the Liberals, who will get fewer seats in the next EU Parliament. Their losses come amidst a boost for the far right, who are set to continue exerting their influence. Their gains have been more limited than many people expected, uh, but uh, they have had already an impact on the other group's position on some of the issues, especially climate and migration. But the far right's overall effect on lawmaking is likely to be limited, as they won't have a blocking majority in the European Parliament. Their impact will also depend on whether Giorgia Meloni's Brothers of Italy and Marine Le Pen's National Rally of France will form a group together. Both parties were strongest in their respective countries. Now Ursula von der Leyen's next challenge begins. She needs to secure two key majorities to get a second term as president of the EU Commission, the bloc's powerful executive arm. Von der Leyen must be nominated by most EU leaders. Then she also needs the majority of lawmakers in the European Parliament to back her. For that, she first called upon her pro-European centrist allies in the previous Parliament. For this reason, we will now approach the large political families that worked well with us in the last mandate. These are the S&D, the Socialists and Social Democrats, and Renew, the Liberals. And renew the Liberalen. Is the far right an option too? It might be. Before the EU elections, Ursula von der Leyen didn't rule out working with Italian Prime Minister Giorgia Meloni. For now, most options are still on the table as the political horse trading begins. So far right gains the big story of the day. What's happening on the left? Giacomo Filibeck is Secretary General of the Party of European Socialists. Uh, that's part of the European Parliament's centre-left Socialists and Democrats bloc. He joins us from Brussels. So welcome to DW. So uh, big gains Thank by you, Europe's uh, far right. The Parliament's still controlled by the centre-right. Where does this leave Europe's socialists? I don't know, but I couldn't agree that the centre-right controls the parliament. They have proportionally won, but without us and without the Liberals, there will be no possible majority that would be identified as a pro-European possible majority. All the rest are uh, speculation that do not uh, concern us. Those red lines that uh, your colleague was referring uh, to before, uh, they are very simple. The perimeter of this uh, new majority that could elect Ursula von der Leyen and the next commission are uh, potentially broadening only to the Green Party, in our opinion. So it can be composed by the APP, the Liberals, ourselves, plus the Green, if necessary, but nothing else. And when I mean nothing else, I mean precisely ECR and ID. If so, they are in, we are out. And if we are out, there is no pro-European majority in the next EP. OK, it's that, it's, that, it's that clear for you? There's no room for negotiation, no, uh, no room for, for horse trading? There is no room to negotiate the future of the European Union, the next five years of the European Union, which will be crucial under so many aspects that now we don't have the time to go through to... 
parties and movements that do not share the fundamental values upon which the European Union itself is founded. So here's the thing. Why then do you think the message of Europe's far-right parties on issues like migration, for instance, is gaining such traction uh, with Europe's voters? The problem exists, and pointing out at the problem and claiming that you have an easy fix for it can be an appealing uh, campaign method. But unfortunately, it has been shown that, especially for a phenomenon like migration, the solutions are not easy to fix. It took us years to reach the Migration and Asylum Pact agreement at the European level. And this is the way to go forward by sharing responsibilities and by doing and facing this challenge together, because migration is it's in itself is not something that you can avoid or skip by claiming that you build a wall or you want to bring down ships and boats in the Mediterranean. So These are populistic formulas that can resonate in some part of the populations, but eventually will not be the solution. So how then do you respond to the populists, uh, to the populist parties and the increasing number of people who vote for them who would say that the answer that you just gave there, it's complicated, let's keep doing this, the same thing that we've been doing. How do, you, how do you convince them that you're not being complacent? The only way to convince our citizens is that we need to work effectively for complicated questions in manners that are delivering a result. And there is no way the European Union would be able ever to deliver a result if there is not a responsible pro-European majority sitting inside the European Parliament. So the best answer is to work hard together with forces that share basic common values and being inspired by those for policies that even if complicated, even if hard to implement, they would be sustainable for the future. I repeat, populistic quick fixes and uh, slogans may work in an electoral campaign, but do not work when you want to run a very complex institution like the European Union with 27 member states okay. and hundreds of millions of citizens. Uh, can we finish with uh, your thoughts on the French president's decision to call parliamentary elections after his coalition was uh, beaten so soundly by uh, Marine Le Pen's uh, far-right national rally? It's definitely a move which seems to be dictated by uh, despair more than anything. But the calculation, I don't think it is uh, uh, necessarily the correct one because... I think that we, the centre-left, and if you see the results of the list led by Rafael Gruxman, Plus Public and the Parti Socialist, together with other uh, centre-left and progressive political force, can potentially build a front populaire which would be the competitive player against Le Pen, not necessarily Macron's part. So, we are never afraid of democracy. We are never afraid of electoral competitions. We are always in favor of uh, confronting ourselves with citizens. And the elections in France may reveal further surprises along the way. Good talking to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Giacomo Filibeck from the Party of European Socialists. Thank you. Let's get more from our correspondent, Rosie Burchard, in Brussels. Welcome, Rosie. Uh, tell us more about uh, who Ursula von der Leyen hopes will be part of her bastion against extremes. Well, listen, Ursula von der Leyen looks as the dust settles on these European Parliament elections to be in good stead. Her centre-right European People's Party came out on top here in the European Parliament and that should, in principle, help her secure that return ticket that she's striving for to return as European Commission President, the leader of the EU's powerful executive that really sets all of the agenda for EU lawmaking. She does need, first of all, the backing of EU leaders and the fact that President Macron 
Macron of France has called these snap parliamentary elections. That could complicate her bid because Macron will be weighing up whether it's a hindrance or a help to his campaign or his party's campaign to declare backing for von der Leyen. Then von der Leyen needs to secure a majority here in the European Parliament, a majority of the seats which you see behind me in the European Parliament's hemicycle. And really it looks like there every, will be every seat to play for because though she has a majority in favour in principle of centrist parties, that centrist majority has held, there will be dissent dissenters within those mainstream groups and therefore it could come down to a bit of a nail-biter for Team von der Leyen and those hoping she secures a second term in office. And uh, looking at reports, uh, uh, certainly in the English-speaking uh, press, uh, uh, Georgia Maloney of I Italy, who has been, who has been seen uh, as being on the far right, she seems to be uh, being touted as something of a, of a queen-maker, if I can put it that way. Well, really what this is going to come down to now is where the red lines are drawn by the centre-right, so where von der Leyen decides to agree to work with essentially because she will be looking for that broad majority and that might mean looking toward indeed some parts of the far right so this question of red lines is really one which is, is hanging over this attempt by European Commission President von der Leyen to get the keys back to the European Commission's headquarters. Uh, and we talk about the, the far right as so though they are one group but there are differences between them. Yeah, absolutely. So, Georgia Maloney's party, the Brothers of Italy, sits with a parliamentary group here in the European Parliament called the European Conservatives and Reformists. And they're nationalist, right-wing politicians, but they're seen as much more politically palatable than the farther right identity and democracy group, which includes parties like the National Rally in France. Now, the fact that Georgia Maloney's party, the Brothers of Italy, has a pro-Ukraine stance, for example, has hel helped it ingratiate itself with mainstream parties in Europe. But domestically, many of its policies are still seen by critics as far right. For example, its stance on LGBTQ or, mar or migrant rights. Now, if von der Leyen continues to do what she has been seen to be doing, which is courting that faction of the far right, so that faction of Europe's hard right, which includes the Brothers of Italy party, she could, on the other hand, enrage parts of the centre-left and left. So she will really have to tread very carefully here as she tries to make, to make her way back to, her, to, to another term, indeed, as European Commission president. Thanks for that, Rosie. DW correspondent Rosie Burchard.